Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's ESA Town Hall. My name is Karen Strupp, and I'm the Vice President of Communications for Infrastructure Resources. I appreciate you joining us for today's Town Hall, where the topic will be, what are the best way to avoid cross wars, which is sponsored by ULC Technologies. Our ESA Town Halls are an open forum to discuss your concerns, present potential solutions, while improving damage prevention and excavation safety. All of our town halls are meant to be a discussion and you're encouraged to ask questions and share some of the solutions you found. If you have a question during the town hall, please type it into the chat box or click on the raise hand icon. Give us a few seconds and we'll give you permission to unmute yourself. To unmute, you'll simply click on the microphone icon in the top right corner of your screen. Please do try to keep your comments brief to allow others time to interact. Know that a recording of this town hall will be posted on the ESA website along with a brief blog post and the chat log. If you comment through chat and do not want your comment or your name included, please note that with your post. We will conclude today's session at 1130 Central Time, but I'm and I'm pleased to have our planners who bring a warmth, wealth of experience and will allow them to give some of their background before we begin. So, Mark, I'll begin with you. Well, I'm Mark Bruce. I'm uh... Vice President of Hydromax USA until the end of June. Uh, continue on as President of Cross Bore Safety Association for a while, and uh, been involved with cross bores for 24 years or something like that. So um, good to have the panel. Thanks for putting this together. Absolutely, Sue. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Sue Jepson. I'm the Lead Program Manager for National Grid for Advanced Field Services. Um, been with National Grid and its predecessors for 26 years. I've been working closely with ULC Technologies, um, working on the cross bore technology and, and acoustic um, technology. Thanks for having me this morning. You're welcome. Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Ed. Uh, thanks, Karen. I appreciate getting everybody together to uh, talk about cross bores. But this is uh, Jeff Maharoski, the cross bore program leader for Columbia Gas in Pennsylvania and Maryland. I've been with Columbia since 2015 and been with the Crossboard program since about 2020. And David? Good morning, everybody. My name is David Steiger, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Technology and Development with Hydromax USA. I'm based out of Louisville, um, and I spent a lot of years managing projects in the field, uh, performing crossbore inspection work. So nice to have everybody together this morning. Nice to meet you all. And Ron. Good morning. My name is Ron Peterson. I'm the executive director of the National Utility Locating Contractors Association. Uh, I'm also the claims avoidance program director for the National Utility Contractors Association, and I'm a utility consultant. I've been in the industry about 30 years. Uh, and in the expert work I do, of just to start, um, probably 40% of the uh, cases I deal with have something to do with bores and cross bores. So it's good to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for joining us to participate. Mark, I'd like to start with you. Our audience typically has a wide range of knowledge on the topic that we have. Would you begin by explaining what is a cross bore and why are they dangerous? Cross bore is an um, intersection of one or more two or more utilities that cause damage to either of the utilities. And it may be uh, any type of utility. It could be sewer, water, gas, fiber optic, anything is fits into that cross bore category. There has been a lot of focus on natural gas um, cross bores that um, are in sewers. So, but we have to be aware that there's other dangerous things, especially electric and so forth. And the fact that when we have um, fiber optic cut or things like that, communications go down that uh, affects safety and so forth. So there's a lot of damages um, that can be prevented by Good practices. Sue, so you presented last July um, in DC and you were at the cross bore workshop. Would you speak to the history and where you're where you're at in the program? Sure. So I had the opportunity to co-present at the AGA cross bore workshop in Washington, DC with uh, ULC uh, Technologies and the timeline with this project is lengthy. So they started back in 2017. National Grid approached 
ULC technologies to look for um, a non-sewer based solution. And then that followed into the following year in 2018, where ULC created a prototype um, of acoustic sensing uh, solution. And then 2019 rolled around and National Grid and PG&E out in California co-funded a piece of testing property with National Grid, basically creating every single situation that a cross bore would um, entail from the depth of soil, the type of soil, the type of product, um, you know, the type of plastic. Um, they set up every single scenario for uh, ULC technology to test their equipment. And 2020 rolled around and the validation of the of the technology was uh, was a success. And um, and that's when National Grid started a pilot program. And then I came in and I've been working with ULC on different types of and all of our locations um, in New York. So my work is is based in New York City, Staten Island and um, and Long Island. So we've focused a lot of projects on our um, directional drilling on Long Island. We recently got an opportunity to test their acoustic equipment on Staten Island. So we're looking to wrap up this pilot program uh, this year, kind of put a bow on it to our, our DIMP group to uh, to say here, here's another tool in the toolbox, you know, for us to um, investigate the uh, the potential cost for us. So that's where we are um, at this moment in time. Thank you, Sue. Jeff, I know that NYSource, uh, you had mentioned when we talked earlier, you guys have a program when you're looking for cross bores and your possible prevention. Would you be willing to speak to that? Yeah, um, yeah Columbia Gas and Nice Source have, uh, we have our, our new construction program and also our legacy cross bore program. Uh, but really everything that dealing with uh, cross bore risk elimination really starts with public awareness. I'm um, just talk, doing exactly what we're doing, talking about cross bores and trying to get the word out as much as possible. Uh, NYSource has a plumbers and center program where we um, give a $300 check to any uh, licensed plumber that reports a gas cross bore to us uh, and, and, and trying to get, again, get the word out and trying to incentivize uh, in information and, and education surrounding cross bores as much as possible. We do uh, a, a tremendous amount of public outreach. Uh, I, I, I present to HOAs. We uh, have give training with plumbers. Uh, we talk with municipalities on, on, on a weekly basis, just again, trying to get information out on cross borders. Um, the cross borders that we found in PA, they, we, they're dated back to the, with an install date into the uh, 70s. Build around cross borders have, you know, a much, uh, they, they, they've been installed much, early, much earlier than that. Um, and and we're, we're finding more and more uh, build around cross borders. Um, Really, the, the biggest message that, that we put out to homeowners and plumbers is, is really to call 811 and to try to get the gas lines located before they do any type of work. Um, knowing that, you know, a thousand PSI and greater can damage a, a, a gas line. Um, there's there's different uh, options out there for homeowners that, that could uh, potentially cause damage to a gas line. There's um, there's jetters and, and different things like that that are available, you know, on Amazon that you can get delivered to your house in a couple of days that has a much higher um, PSI rating than uh, than 1000 PSI. Our program, our legacy cross board program began in 2013, so we're about about a decade into it that that uh, began being it was it's all DIMP driven. Um, and our legacy program focuses on pre 2008 um, pipe and any anywhere where we have pre 2008 pipe, we televise both sanitary and storm lines. Um, we look at all damages, whether you can see a, cro a cross bore or not, or if it's just crushed pipe and you see debris. We we look at all of that as a potential cross bore, and and uh, we we verify that it's not a cross bore before we we move forward on, on anything. Um, we determine where we're going to be going by looking at different high priority areas. We look at history of previous damage. Um, jo we review job orders for boring activity. We look at areas where there's hospitals, schools, um, nursing homes, different geographical attributes, um, you know, notification by other parties, um, 
basement floor depth if it's a uh, trailer park or if it's a slab home um, we we try to get in, information on the sewer system depth uh, try to get a, as much information as possible before we start an area uh, we use a risk model and we're on our second risk model currently we started out with the Vantech we're on uh, a synergy risk model and that looks at different uh, uses different model structures to to help us determine on, on where to go um, we take uh, common cro common cross board properties um, and and put them into uh, different buckets we, and we we use the diameter of, of the pipe material asset type we use different uh, areas area statistics to determine to help us on, on where to go we use a, it's a word analysis where we uh, put in the install date you know different uh, if trench technology was used or anything else like that um, and that can we look at that it can be put in either a heat map or just broken down into different map grids um and on for our new construction and and training on our employees we also um we, we focus heavily on on, on training we have uh, LMS, which is online training for current employees, new employees and contractors. They go through in, in class training. We have refresher training um, before work is complete. We we review SOP, standard operating procedures, uh, with high high consequence task reviews, and also our gas standards, which uh, which uh, you know, lay out our our policies and procedures. Um, we have different uh, we use sewer locate cards whenever we're using any type of trenches technology. We we spot and pothole if it's needed. Um, we uh, we locate all known facilities. The the biggest um, area that we I think we've improved lately is um, locating all, all before we do any any type of trenches technology and even whenever we're open cutting it at, at times locating the sanitary laterals. Sanitary laterals don't fall under 811 guidelines because they're not owned by the municipality. They're owned by the homeowner. Homeowner doesn't receive an 811 ticket. You know, it and and Columbia Nice Source I think has done a, a tremendous job at locating that. That way, we're not creating cross bores even by open cut method. Um, whenever we insert, we we uh, either pre camera or 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 post camera within 60 days um, to to make sure that we're not inserting and do a, a build around cross bore or, or a cross bore that was that was previously created. One of the points of note that just came up on the chat, sorry, um, is Pennsylvania has a special potential cross board notification and process. So Bill, thank you for letting us know about that. Um, and Jeff, if you don't mind, you were talking a little bit about training and technology. And I know when we had our earlier call, David, you were talking about some of the technology that people have that they may not realize. Um, I think this lends itself to be that training opportunity for those that are in the audience. Do you want to speak to some of the information that they may have that that they don't realize that they've already collected? Uh, yeah, so I think Jeff mentioned actually one of the things that we've seen that's really helpful, which is searching through like claims data to understanding where you've created cross borders is really how you end up creating a powerful risk model or you know, uh, prioritization model for inspection. So uh, really doing a deep dive through the records you have, whether they're in GIS or whether they're in claim your, your claim system, whatever that may be, your, your work order system in the field. Uh, to be able to to do keyword searches and things like that, categorize that data. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot that isn't really utilized, which is the the actual camera inspections or uh, things like what Sue mentioned with the uh, acoustic systems. All of these systems that are designed to go out and collect information, whether it's video or GPS, et cetera. There's usually a data component to it, and we see a lot of times that that isn't included uh, in in the deliverable from contractors performing work in the field to the utility that's actually you know cataloging and trying to analyze this data so uh, just wanted to mention to everybody for every camera truck that's out there for almost all of the uh, systems like ulcs there's going to be some sort of csv file or something like that that will record all of the observation information and that information can be really really valuable not only for making sure that you're you know your contractors are doing the work that you assigned them to do and they're getting everything complete as the way you define it but also to do analysis down the road when you have lots and lots of csv files that you can crunch together and, and do you know data analysis you can get a much more powerful output out of that in the long term you're on mute 
Thank you. That would be something that I have for our audience of. Is that something that you were aware of before these CSV files that you would have the access to for the service that's already been provided? Um, I think that's that's very interesting and hopefully a takeaway that someone will have that that they have more information than they may be realized. Um, Jeff, if you would speak to um, legacy cross bores and, and near misses as far as the dirt report is concerned. Yeah, um, Columbia and, and NISource has recently began um, using the, the dirt um, to record legacy cross bores when, and when we find them. The hopes of that are is to use a lesson learned approach um, and improve different safety measures and also use that to help um, other utilities and, and um, be, build their legacy cross board programs. And the more information that, that we get submitted in there as, as a, a near miss, and really I, I look at all all cross bores if there was not an escape of gas as a near miss because the potential behind the cross bore you know, could be catastrophic. Um, and that's what I've, I've talked with Mark and, and David in the past, you know, that knowing that there could be a cross bore out there that we haven't found keeps us up at night, it really does. And trying to do everything we possibly can to keep our communities and our customers safe. Uh, and uh, utilizing dirt is just one more avenue that, that we're able to, to help the, build the industry on, on cross board prevention. As we look at the data collection in the chat, Dave Heldenbrand, who's with Bison Engineering, um, made a note that he's collecting data on the distance from the location of a cross bore to the structure that's been involved in a fire or explosion, the number of cross bores that did not cause the fire or explosion. We can reduce the injuries and fatalities from this information. So Dave, I, I welcome you to put your email address in the chat box as you're asking people to contact you. If, um, if Dave is unable to do that or you'd like to get in contact with him, please let me know I have his information, but I, I agree that any of the data and the information that we can pull together for a, for a larger collection is gonna is gonna benefit us. Um, Ron, I know as an expert witness, what would you say are some of the lessons learned from the past cross incidents that we should be taking to improve safety measures, our regulations, damage prevention strategies, training policies, just anything that you've had as those takeaways of some of the consistencies that you see that are really avoidable? Well, I think we 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 have a couple of you know what I see anyway with causes the obvious ones wasn't located didn't know it was there mostly with sewer laterals and such um, another one that's surprising and a lesson that should be learned from that is is potholing you know at the point of crossing not somewhere that was convenient uh, I see a lot of a lot of issues there where you know okay here's here's a place over here beside the sidewalk we pothole down we find it then we bore four feet under under pavement and there was a change in elevation so you know we fall back into trying to train our field people to to follow these simple steps you know i want to watch that bore head pass safely by the marked utility and then the back reamer come back and safely miss it so i think we need to do maybe a better job say we collectively we at, at educating our, our our contracting community um on that but it's not just the contractors i mean look it seems like a real simple issue utilities locate it excavators find it and miss it but we as we all know there's there's a whole dynamic of things that go with that fortunately i think the technology as we talked earlier is getting to be better and we'll we'll continue to work that way but we've got to take those lessons learned and, and do something with them i mean i to me one of the biggest things we have to do is making sure that moving forward everything we put in the ground is locatable by a traditional easy means um and then we have the entire legacy issue to go back with which is difficult to say the least do any of the other panel mark go ahead yeah, I think that along uh, what Ron just said, locatable, uh, I believe that you'll see in the future, as in some other countries, and including Canada, parts of Canada, that the location of utilities are on a GIS map. And those GIS, GIS maps uh, would allow very rapid response to locate requests rather than waiting days or maybe not even getting it done within the timeline. Having accurate maps. Um, will allow response times in British Columbia as low as two and a half minutes from the, the utility. So now the, the contractors win by having a device and you can use very high resolution mapping, uh, GIS mapping, not just a Google Maps, but something very high resolution that has good 
registration with the location showing on the on the um, satellite view with the actual place on the ground. So those things, I believe, will help uh, expand damage prevention to homeowners and to it's going to put a shrub in the yard. You know, they'll say, hey, I'm at Home Depot. I'm going to buy a, a tree. I look on the map uh, It's provided by my utility. And yes, I see, no, I can't do that right there. I better buy something else and put it in a different place. So we have a lot of opportunity We're using new technology that we aren't actually using right now. We're, we're touching on it occasionally. So there's lots of opportunities with traditional, but just take the information capability we have today, as people have been talking here right now, and utilize that in a way that uh, looks to the future solutions, not just where we are today. We did have one person make a comment uh, saying that just because there's a mapping system, just because the mapping system is called spatial, that does not mean the data is spatially correct. And I think that that's one of the things that that everybody on the panel would agree with. And it's one of the places that we have some room for improvement. So, David, you had a comment that you'd like to make. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, a couple of pieces of technology, too, that are cheap and that would help the homeowner, especially in those types of situations with the sewer lateral. One is the flushable sond. Uh, a lot of people don't know that that exists, but they're heavily <laughs> there. You go. That's the best one right there, too, because they cost thirty six dollars. Um, and, you know, if you lose it, no, no big deal. A lot of our team, they use fishing line and just tie it on there and that way you can flush it and then you can pull it back out and reuse it, wash it off for later, later use. Um, but if the, the one thing I wanted to caution on that is a flushable sawn, like if you're actually boring something, a flushable sawn might give you one, you know, might give you from the toilet out to the, to the sewer main. But if there are branches to that lateral, which there are in, on average, at least on our statistics, coast to coast on the projects that we've run, it's about one in three the houses on the on the coasts. The further you get inland, it's about one in five to one in eight, somewhere in that range, depending on where you are in the country. So you don't know, right, if you don't have a map of your house already. Uh, and as a contractor, that's one of the biggest difficulties is getting all of the branches located so that you know if you're going to shoot a line all the way up to a, a gas meter that there's not a branch even if the main sewer you know sewer lateral runs on the left side of the house and your gas meter is on the right hand side there could be a branch that goes to the right side wraps around the back to a bathroom that was added later on so there, there are there are lots of pieces of technology out there that can add ability to locate things but you have to be aware of those blind spots, uh, you know, and that's main reason why we still use cameras. There are some exciting developments in uh, GPR that we've uh, we've been working with the University of Washington on some different bands of GPR that are adding additional resolution at deeper depths. Um, haven't seen anything commercially available that's made us change our tune entirely yet, but uh, they are getting there pretty quickly and I believe will be available pretty soon. Ron? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that uh, along with what Dave just said, um, you, you know, <laughs> you have to fill your toolbox with tools. And the more tools we get, the more accuracy. I just happen to have that flushable sign there for a class I'm, I'm doing, but you have to fill that tool. Radar is changing uh, a lot, but again, radar is not the silver bullet. If you do that outside my yard, you're not going to see anything. If I go other places, you will. So you have to have a, a, a toolbox full of tools to do that. Uh, one of the problems with that is, and, and it's, it's a systemic problem, is our locating industry in response to 811, it's not patterned or set up to run with a whole bunch of tools in the toolbox, whether the utility is not paying for it or the other guys don't have it or the contract guys. It, it's a rough situation with that. Now, private locators is another story, um, but our current system does not allow really for for the use of all these tools and for the locator to be there. And, you know, 25, 30 years ago, I was there with my, my contractor working with him to find these things. Um, that's not the way it is now, and maybe that needs to change as well. That brings up a point that was in the chat that David, you started speaking to, but the question um, is, do the contractors get informed that in some states they don't locate the sewer laterals and are they educated on how to find the lines and do their due diligence? So I, I'm not sure um, if any of you would like to speak to that, David. I, I can just add my experiences. 
it's not even state to state, at least in my experience, it's city to city, even some parts of the city, some parts of the you know older parts of the city. Uh, you get areas where they were in combined sewer, old cities like Cincinnati, Seattle, New York, where they're uh, where the sewers were combined for many, many years. And then that Clean Water Act, so like later neighborhoods that were built later are going to have separated storm and sanitary. Old neighborhoods are still going to have these combined sewers. And sometimes you get uh, a lateral that looks like a lateral coming off of those that goes to a downspout. Uh, the next one goes to another downspout. Then the third one finally goes to the actual sanitary line in the house. So you get this mixed bag situation and it's really it really gets difficult. And that's where the mapping effort that we need to go through as a country over the next however many years it's going to take to really get these things mapped accurately and to get in the hands of the average person, the person calling 811 that is, you know, trying to put a shrub in their front yard, the ability to understand in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, where these things are. Because the biggest, the biggest issue I've seen with really accurate mapping is then people assume that Z is the depth below the surface. And as soon as you've got landscaping happening, as soon as you've got any kind of regrading or anything going on, now that depth is not the same. And so a true Z value versus a, a depth that everybody can understand quickly, I think is going to be one of the big challenges to that. But to Mark's point, I mean, the real uh, one of the biggest problems I hear contractors complain about calling 811 and the reason people hit stuff and they get, you know, they, they skirt the regulations is because of the time it takes. If they've got a job and they've got to get on another job tomorrow, et cetera, I, I don't think that's a valid excuse, but it is the real reason why most people cut those corners. And if you could get a response with a nice three dimensional map that was very easy to understand in a few minutes, your, your likelihood to use that service regularly would be significantly better. And it, in the same token, if it was in the hands of the locator, that's actually going to paint the information on the ground. In, in either case, it's a much better outcome. Jeff, did you have something that you wanted to add? It just wanted to reiterate what Dave was saying. You know, um, it really does differ down to the municipality or borough to borough um, on on their mapping and if they're able to locate their systems at all. Some some areas we get we get into, they have really great maps. Others, you're looking at a paper map from 1800, um, and you know they don't they don't know where their lines are. Uh, and, and that's something with the Legacy Crossbar Program. There's a lot of areas where we're able to uh, to tell municipalities or cities where, where lines are, where laterals run to. Um, that, that really helps them out. But yeah, it's, that, that's that's one of the biggest struggles is even before we do any type of excavation or uh, or boring, that's why we we spend the resources we do on locating different things. And especially during, because uh, we, we, we don't do any type of blind boring whatsoever. We make sure that if we're boring, we're, we know wherever, even downspouts, where, where they run to. Um, but yeah, it, with excavation, you sometimes you get the, the sanitary mains located storm lines not so much um but it, it really it varies uh, municipality to municipality we did have nathan i'm not sure what state he's in but uh he represents a sewer utility and he said we put it in our positive response to the contractor that the lab laterals are private and we do not locate them but the contractors can call into the office for lateral information and we'll provide their, their records to the best of their ability so the communication seems it's taking place um, and Bill Kiger said that cross bores are treated as emergency in Pennsylvania with a two hour response. So my yeah, next I, thing would be, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, along, along the lines of um, the, the laterals that you have and the response time and the information available. I believe my earlier uh, comment regarding mapping is supposing that all mapping from here on out has to be now redone. I don't think any of the mapping you have hardly is valid because it may have been changed if it was taken a year ago or two years ago. Until you have the tracking traceability, at least on gas, which is now rolling out to the utilities, you have a way to update your maps as any time it's touched or that asset has changed. So if you thought you had a really good map yesterday, somebody might have done something today and now it's wrong and out of date. So the update of the map is, and the processes to do that are, are rolling out, and that's the critical step for the gas industry. But it's um, the future. It might be a 50 year Davis point, it's probably a 50 year timeline. But we have a lot of tools out in the toolbox that people use. And we have to remember that 
the systems are different. The complications are different. I, I grew up in a city that was very simple, a little town in Indiana. It was, you know, 90 degrees to the house, one lateral. But we go in places that I've, I've seen that you'll have a lateral that will run across the street, across another block, and then tie into a, a sewer line over there because that house was built first and the subdivision developed around it and there were no sewers close by. And you see double houses, how, double laterals going to one house. So you have to chase all these things down to prevent cross scores. And knowing where those sewers are and keeping them open to Ron's point so you can watch the crossing of a new bore to make sure that um, that it misses. Just because just you locate a, another utility and know where you want to bore doesn't mean your new bore missed it. And you have to leave those, to my opinion, if you're using that as a way of, of uh, verifying that you do not have a cross bore, you have to leave that excavation open until you cross. I was just going to add to one other comment is Z values like true elevations versus depth, because if you go out, you collect a bunch of really high X and Y, you know, you got your latitude and longitude really accurately, but you just collect a depth, uh, you know, five feet, three inches. Ten years from now, who knows? I mean, two days from now, who knows if that's valid because of landscaping and regrading and the constant, you know, shifting. So that's the one other thing that I've seen a lot of people regret. Uh, 10 years into a program is instead of this depth value right here, I should have got a proper Z value, which is a little more of a pain when you're using GPS to get it right. It takes a little bit longer to you know collect the information, but then you don't have to worry about any of that stuff in the future. That's great. Nathan's questions that he had put in, in the or comment that he had put in the chat brings up my next question. And Mark, I'll start with you, but how can utility companies and contractors improve their collaboration and communication to ensure those safe, excav safe excavation practices and prevent cross bores? I think Mark is frozen. David, do you want to take that? Okay. Oh, he might be back now. Can you hear us, Mark? Am I back? I'm yes. Back. Were you able to hear the okay, question? Sorry. Yes, I was. Uh, it got a little blurry, but uh, the um, there's a, the, the outreach, the physical outreach. Some utilities put into collaboration with contractors, going out and meeting with contractors and building that uh, you know, rapport for eight one one locating and 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 education. Uh, I've seen reports from utilities saying they've had a really great success with that, and they end up doing a lot more work because of it. Eight one one locates because of it. But also, once you have mapping that you gain because of a crossbow program, you're working with utilities to get their sewer maps. There's information there, at least gives you an idea of what's in the area. You get the reports if you have a crossbow program that's ongoing. That uh, location of the sewers that are located part of the crossbow program should be uploadable and available to the contractor doing new work. So now he, he knows, well, oh, we've already located this last year. This is more information. So you have to be suspect all the information is inaccurate, but it, the more information you have, the more uh, opportunities for avoidance. So sharing data that is obtained internally, that may be from a sewer system, because of a cross border program needs to know where the sewer system is as best they have it. Share that with the installing contractor as well. Share, share that with your design team. Bring it all together, get it into your GIS system, and the more knowledge everybody has, the better off we'll be. Absolutely, Ron. Yeah, just to, to back Mark's point as well, I, I think there's there has been a fundamental fear of doing anything or providing anything to contractors or even design phase to providing information um, for whatever the reasons have been, everything from proprietary to national security, whatever the excuse. The more information we give our contractors, the more information we give designers, the better off we're going to be. I, I can remember 20 years ago uh, in a contract locating situation, not being allowed to provide any information to the designer who was putting together a project. Nothing. And then it went to, well, we can give them maps, but the maps were kind of to Jeff's point a while ago from, you know, 1940. Uh, so they provided no useful information. And I hate country to country comparisons, but I'm going to make one. You go to Australia. Um, you call in your locate, your dial before you dig, 
the utilities are sending you maps, meet you meaning the contractor, and you were working with a locator with those maps. They they don't have the uh, the density and that we do in utilities, but they don't have the damages we have either because they're collaboratively working together. We have to get over our mistrust. I hear all the time, I can't give that contractor information because he might just go off the map and not look for it. Well, giving somebody more information doesn't relieve them of the responsibility to follow the law and the rules and the industry practices. So we need as an industry to get over that. And obviously we have, we have two utility members here that are quite good in their companies at, at, at doing the right things. Why can't everybody? Thank you. Mark? I think on that line, uh, Jeff was getting to that point. In Pennsylvania, and Bill Cogger, I know, has uh, made a few comments here. Um, Pennsylvania has moved the, the ball down the court in that direction. That any, I believe it's true, and Jeff could probably correct me if I'm wrong, that any information that a sewer utility has has to be provided. They may not have any, and they don't pr have, provide, have to provide it and go out and locate it, but any information they have, and that starts moving that ball uh, down the court like Ron's been talking about a little bit. Bill, it looks like you were, Bill Kiger, it looks like you were going to type a comment, but it didn't go completely. Uh, Mike, I'd, or Levi had asked that you'd unmil unmute Bill's microphone. Um, and then, Bill, if you'd raise your hand, if you'd like to share your comment, you're you're more than welcome to. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on what Marcus said, uh, cross bores became a very important component uh, a number of years ago, and and we addressed that. We've built the system to do that uh, notification quickly and directly. And uh, Columbia Gas, one of the founding fathers of that or that uh, effort, as well as UGI, uh, Eric Schwartley, uh, both he and and uh, Columbia have worked very hard to uh, improve that process. Along with the other utilities, have gotten involved as well. I've uh, sent Karen a, a copy of the brochure. There is a blue bore on the face of it. We've got permission from People's Gas, People's Natural Gas. Uh, to use that anywhere you want. Anybody's looking for a logo to stick on in front of it, help yourself. Also, I got permission from uh, XL Energy to use the call before you clear tagline for that purpose. Again, they've already told you about how important it is to notify and, and to address cross bore issues. Uh, you know, one of the big things I can uh, suggest is that Anybody that's putting in a line using any type of trenchless technology needs to pothole each crossing and use subsurface utility engineering uh, techniques to get things done ahead of time rather than in the heat of the battle. Again, I'm happy to share my information with uh, you and uh, uh, you can post that uh, link that I sent you. It's our uh, program and uh, Happy to help anybody that wants to uh, work with me. Absolutely. We will share that in the recap information that we send out to all the attendees, as well as contact information for Pennsylvania 811. Um, David, one of the things that we had talked about was video and database information, regardless of software, um, and how that can be helpful when you're collaborating between the utility and the contractor. Would you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, for those who are maybe more from the either electric or water or, or uh, gas side of things, the, the, the governing body, if you will, uh, for the sewer world uh, and under the EPA guidelines is NASCO. Um, and NASCO is the National Association of Sewer Service Contractors. That that group is essentially what sets the the standards for how the data is collected on the, the typical EPA programs. You'll hear LACP and PACP, that's pipeline assessment certification and lateral assessment certification. Those, those are just essentially the standards for the way that the data is collected while an inspection is being performed. And all of the softwares that are on all of the camera trucks that exist out there, whether it's PipeLogix or WinCan or Possum or whatever, Granite, they all are built around that structure primarily. So there's a database component that has a pretty standard structure. Now on the cross-board programs, 
or any other program where you're just doing like pre-locating, et cetera, they may not be using this, the full template, but the data will still be collected in that format. And what we've seen a lot, what we do, I know with uh, certain cities that we work with, uh, is that we're collecting that data in a kind of, we'll call it a PACP or LACP light format, where we're not doing all of the coding that normally takes a long time. Because if you're in the business of, of, of actually doing an EPA inspection, the, the speed at which you can camera a sewer is significantly slower than if you're just looking for cross bores. So in most cases, the the gas utility or the electric utility, they don't want to pay the sewer inspector to, to go and do a full like EPA compliance inspection, but you can still get that data in that format and then it can be used as a, you know, a, a, a bargaining chip, if you will, or a, a scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of situation to help the utility not only get more lateral information, because as we've all said that the sewer uh, operators generally don't even know where the laterals are, they might know where the taps are, they don't know where they run, um, and then they they won't have you know actual inspections. And those inspections can be really helpful because I know that in, in the sewer world, especially, they're looking for I and I all the time. You know, they get in trouble when the sewer overflows when it rains. That's the biggest thing that everybody is trying to prevent at, when they operate a sewer uh, collection system. So getting the data in that format can be really valuable to them. It can help make sure that you know the 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 two-way communication stays open. And then GPS was the last piece. I mean, if you can GPS while you perform, whether it's an acoustic inspection, uh, whether it's GPR, whether it's you know uh, sewer cameras, actually getting high accuracy GPS positions for those, uh, those manholes or valves or clean outs or whatever it is, is extremely valuable to updating the mapping information uh, so that everybody can benefit from that in the future, so. Thank you. And Jeff, with all that information as one of the utilities that's on the call, you have a lot of things coming at you. How do you do you have a process for matching that up? Yeah, um, we our, our deliverable process is it's a requirement that everything does match between our spreadsheets or mapping and also the, the data on the video. Um, and if we want somebody that doesn't have any uh, experience working with cross boards or working with mapping or, or spreadsheets to be able to look at that information, you know, five, 10 years, 15 years down the road and be able to easily determine what they're looking at. And all the all data on the mapping correlates with all data on the spreadsheets and, and it matches up with the video. Um, we're looking at different ways to even uh, automate that to make sure that, that everything is is exactly uh, as uh, as we're expecting. Um, and, and when we're piloting an, an AI program right now, we're um, we're really excited about uh, potentially moving forward on, on on that. And yeah, everything that that we have, it it needs to match up, or it there's it doesn't do us any good. Sue mapping keeps coming up. Do you want to speak to the sewer maps that exist or not in in the Long Island area? <laughs> I've been twisted in my chair on this one. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, we um, on Long Island struggle severely. Um, we do not have access to sewer maps, you know, at all. And and um, that's the frustrating part, right? So, um, you know, in, in, in order to just be efficient, um, that we just, you know, add a layer to, to our efficiency and, uh, and, and safety too, um, and, and just give us a better overall, um, you know, scope of the project that we're dealing with. Um, you know, it just when you when you're going over um, a project and you're looking at all your components, that's always the one that's missing, right? I mean, and then you go out in the field and you can suggest where it may be, but you know, um, like you know earlier, I think Mark, you were talking about how the different constructions, right? The the first old house on the block and then the subdivisions, you know, follow throughout the generations, and so you don't know what you don't know. Um, you know, previously, you know, before you got there or, or when the project or what projects were there previously. Um, one of the things that National Grid um, has been working over the years, um, almost about eight years now, is our stakeholder engagement group is really in depth in communicating 
um, with the industry, with the small mom and pop hardware stores, you know, taking those SIC codes, those standard, um, you know, standard industrial codes and really looking at the hardware stores, the small engineering firms, the, you know, the, the really small um um, types of businesses where we can get the education out because I think getting edu- getting in front of it more so, um, you know, and even getting in front of the municipalities with complaining about the mapping and things like that. They, again, don't know what they don't know. So if they think everything is fine, if nobody is communicating with them. So, um, yeah, thanks. Mark? Yeah, to support Sue's education theme, um, we have to remember, I, I find myself uh, missing it some, at some point. I've been around cross boards and talking about so much. Sometimes I remember there's a new batch of, of, of uh, young people coming into the industry all the time. And as we talk about it, we have to make sure we go back and pick up the 101 side of the business and just do the basics in our education, not skip over that and just get to the high level. Because sometimes we'll leave that middle part, that early part out of it. Well, that's, that's one reinforcement of what you said, Suzanne, and the fact that you're going out to smaller groups. You can go to the plumbing association. You can go with the plumbing unions and work with them. And that's been done by different utilities. But I think those things have a tendency to be early, and then they taper off after someone that's very motivated leaves that. We need to structure, maybe through uh, Jeff's move to, which I like a lot, bringing up everything through the DERP program, reporting everything so the other utilities can see that. That's a big, big smart move in my opinion so there's a lot of opportunities so the, let me go back to some basic questions do i'm posing this for everybody to think about do we need to inspect for storm sewers as well as sanitary sewers for gas installations so i mean that's a question i believe that everybody has an opinion so what you come down to and you'll say at what point as jeff mentioned earlier well steel pipe or pipe older than this or a certain diameter it's thick enough it's not going to get cut by a rotor rooter or whatever we start uh eliminating those and moving their risk categories down so there's decisions that are sophisticated at a legal level at a at a high level in the organizations that need to be made as you do the programs but more importantly all these decisions need to be reviewed on a, a continual basis because it's ever changing you got more information you have more data and now what you Mark, I believe your, your decision making. So, okay. oh, you were cutting out for a little bit. Go yeah, just go ahead. I'm sorry. You're uh, dominating it too much. No, 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 not at all. Jeff, do you have a comment that you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, speak more on um, televising uh, and inspecting both the storm as well as the sanitary. It's very easy for utilities and for companies to only focus to focus solely on the sanitary systems because we know there's a direct line from the sanitary main into into a house through a lateral but in the older in the older systems the older homes you could easily have a a, a floor drain tied into a storm system as what dave was talking about earlier uh, the the older combined systems we we more than likely you're going to find cross boards in the storm line rather than in a sanitary main just because of depth but we 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 find crossbores all the time in storm systems where there is a lateral tied into that storm main coming into into another person's home or coming in, in from a, from a house from a floor drain or even it it could potentially have gas escape just to the foundation in a, a downspout drain and we've had crossbores in the past in storm lines that uh, r- that the gas line ruptured because of flow. Um, the, the the gas line rubbing against the crossboard material uh, within it, that would create an escape of gas. If, if it's a thin whistle pipe, even we've had crossboards where uh, the crossboard was laid underneath a, uh, a a thin whistle storm storm pipe. The storm pipe was laid on top of it. Over time, the the storm the, the bottom of the storm drain deteriorated, rotted out, and there's a jagged edge on the on the gas line. Didn't have escape of gas, but there is damage on that gas line. They're um, just from water flow and rubbing the slightly rubbing the the gas line and and, and it damages against the thin whistle. It's uh, I, I'm thankful that NISORS does um, put the effort that we that we do into televising storm lines because we have we there's countless uh, examples of the benefit behind televising storm on on top of sanitary. 
Steve. I was just going to add two things real quick. One was uh, Bill Kiger mentioned in the chat here that the the age of the city plays a big deal and absolutely wanted to reinforce, you know, the older the city, the more likely you are to have these combined sewer lines. Maybe some get detached once new storm only lines get put in, but that, but you never know. And to Jeff's point, we've seen a lot where sanitary lines are dumping into the storm, storm, uh, you know, uh, downspouts are connected into the sanitary line and vice versa. So that's really important. Second piece of that is the newer neighborhoods. A, a lot of plumbers, don't like to have to jack up concrete and things like that. So what we see more frequently is the newer developments, instead of having one nice sewer lateral that comes into the house and then branches, they like to lay six or seven branches out in the yard because then if they ever have to come back and dig it up or do service on it or access a clean out, they don't have to go in the house. They don't have to mess with that. So you kind of get this double edged sword for the newer stuff and you end up getting these more complicated multi-branch sewers that are outside the foundation that are a potential risk for cross bore. The last thing I was going to mention too, just something that we had seen was in storm lines. It, while there is greater ventilation potentially, if there was a rupture of say a gas line, we also see much greater animal uh, gnawing activity. I've seen a lot of teeth marks on a lot of gas lines in storm uh, because for whatever reason, the oils or I don't know. I mean, I've had raccoons eat my garage wood, so clearly they just get hungry enough at some point, um, but that is a big risk. And there have been a, a few projects that we've been on where they've actually had a rupture because I think one one was an otter and another one was a, a rat that had chewed through the gas line. One question that I want to be sure that I get to um, came in from someone who was unable to attend, but I'm going to direct this to Ron. Uh, I know that the guest was located out in Washington State and um, he said his simple answer for sewer purveyors is to locate the lateral, but they always say it's too expensive. So I know with your background, you can speak to where the costs come in on the other side when you don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's I hear it's too expensive all the time. And I, I kind of bristle sometimes when I hear it unlocatable because everything's locatable. It's just how much money do you want to spend and who's going to spend the money to do it? Um, you know, but... <laughs> That the the expense after the fact after after an explosion uh, there's no it, there's no comparison I mean it's it's better to spend the money up front it's just who's spending it to find it to prevent the cross bores um, as opposed to when something goes terribly wrong after the fact and now we spend five years in a court case and hundreds of millions of dollars so it's always better to prevent um, we do have you know like like you said the the answer is simple uh, but it's not easy. It's how do we get, you know, again, everything going forward has to be locatable uh, by traditional means, not, you know, and then what do we do about the past and how do we inform? Well, it's better communication. Um, it's getting rid of those trust, mistrust factors between, you know, utility, locator and contractor working together to get all the information. I mean, we we dump a lot, a lot of responsibility on contractors and, and they should have responsibility. But if we don't set them up to be successful, in other words, better design with everybody participating in that design as far as providing decent information, if we don't set them up, these are these are just going to continue to happen. So I don't know if that really answered the question, but um, I'd rather spend a little money up front than a lot of money later. I think I think that's the biggest takeaway piece is it's it's one of those things that, you know, it it should be the cost of that prevention and, and running your business in the way that you should. Um, yeah. So at the, can, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, and, and to support Ron is we have to write that um, damage prevention piece appropriately in specifications so the contractors that do a good job can get supported and financially re reimbursed versus someone that comes in and does fly by night um, that's not gonna do a full job. So we have to write the specs in. Thank you. So as we're nearing the end of our time for the call today, um, each of our panelists are going to be highlighting a moving forward step to ensure that we can stay focused on practical and impactful solutions. So Mark, I'll start with you of what the solution or step of someone could take. And I saw that you did share the leading practices. We will share that in our in our post uh, town hall information as well. Yeah, yeah I got to jump on the sharing the leading practices, but that document was worked with a bunch of different organizations, including AGA, directly with utilities and, and just members of cross-board safety association and just interested parties. 
if you look at that as a starting point with you first identify risk and what that level of risk is for the utility that has to be first identified did you say well do i need a crossbow program and well most people are saying yes you do but that's the first step then you have to say how am i going to manage that program and i got to do two things i either have to get money budgeted or or get the program staff in place but maybe simultaneously do both you got to get those things going as a very basis and then the, if you go back to leading practices it will suggest ideas and it's not appropriate for every place and every one but follow those thought processes and see if they fit your need as a utility or a contractor or a purveyor of, of, of uh, cctv services in the end um, i believe that the work has to be verifiable you can't just do it and say you have no way to trace trace it and track it and 10 years later say well I, don't, I lost all that information to me that's wrong you have to have verifiable data i, I know i evaluated a project that had 328,000 inspections on it cross board inspections and uh, that project was running at a 5.87 uh, sigma so we can get high level high quality projects done at um, at on the cross board project and i suggest keep it all those things in your mind but in the end design your own system that suits your needs for your utility Thank you very much. Jeff, I'll go to you. Yeah, to name only one thing to take away it would definitely be you know, once we have a uh, cross board that's found uh, and put the data in, in the dirt, the, the larger that that grows, the more it's going to help everybody um, by, by all means. But I also definitely you know, just calling 811 um, and for, for everything, ensuring that the gas lines are marked before we dig, jet, clean, do, do any type of uh, any type of subsurface work. Um, we, we have to call 811 and just continue to get the word out and, and the, uh, the hazards around, um, you know, not working safely. Thank you very much. Ron? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> educate, communicate, and collaborate. Let's keep, you know, share information, build information, and move forward. That's, uh, you know, everything everybody else has said so far, I bet that. I'll leave it at that. All right. Sue? Well, it's hard to be second to last. However, <laughs> uh, my in my in my world, you know, I come from the new innovations, um, and and I'm in into putting new thoughts and equipment out in the field. So if there's an idea out there to um, that you think may not be, or you just have something, just bring, talk to somebody about it. You know, reach out to people. Um, you know, share, collaborate your ideas, right? And say, hey, I think I have something new out there. You know, it's like, you don't know if you throw it on the wall, it may stick, it may not, right? So um, keep an open mind and, um, and, and again, you know, keep the knowledge base out there, right? And, and I think it's really important, Mark, you, you had said it earlier about um, the new generation of, of, um, employees that are coming in, right? So that communication as to what is a cross bar, how do we prevent them, what technology is out there? And I think it's key to communicate to that, to, you know, to that group of folks. Thank you again for having me today. Absolutely, and Sue, I think what you said about keeping an open mind and with the next generation coming, some of the things that may have been tried before didn't work then, but they may try now as you have a new mind looking at it and we have advancements in technology. So I think that, that piece itself is is wonderful. Um, and then David, we'll conclude with you. All right, my my going forward thought here is just look at the use of GPS for any of the activities that are done in the field. The cost of GPS equipment has gone down drastically over the last few years. You can get really high accuracy information without the cost of survey equipment in the past. and Everybody that I've ever worked with in the last 15 years of doing this that didn't start out that way at some point regretted it. Uh, that's that's my takeaway. It's worth the time and energy to to and the cost up front to, as Ron said, spend a little bit of money now to save yourself a lot of money in the future. Yeah, I think definitely looking at it as an investment um, and a protection is just some of that shift that may need to happen. But 
I appreciate everyone joining us and sharing for our panelists, sharing your thoughts, concerns. I appreciate everyone in the chat that shared what they're working with and what some advancements that they've had are. If you would, please take a moment now to fill out our brief survey that Levi will be posting in the chat. We'll continue to improve our discussions and address topics that are important to you. And there is also an additional field. If you'd like to provide your preferred mailing address, you'll receive a complimentary 2023 excavation safety guide. And on behalf of everyone at IR, I would like to thank you all for joining us. A recording of the town hall will be posted at excavationsafetyalliance.com, where you'll also be able to register for future town halls. Our next town hall is going to be June 8th, where we'll be discussing how can be GPR be used successfully in damage prevention. You're also encouraged to join us on May 16th when we hold, host the Global GPR Congress, which is a free event in partnership with Bigman Geophysical. And to our panelists, Thank you all for sharing your expertise. I genuinely appreciate it. To our sponsor, ULC Technologies, thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you for joining us and having a great day. Stay safe. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.